The results are in. And after the initial run of experimentation, I feel confident in saying that we've discovered evidence that yes, mass does attract mass. Gravity is real. Today, we're going to take a look at the first run of experimentation and all the data from it so that everyone with the know-how can crunch the numbers. I'm going to be honest that I, for one, am not smart enough to use these numbers to come up with conclusions. My eyes went cross just doing the math I'm about to show you, but I wanted to provide the information so that everybody can see it and evaluate it for themselves. As many saw, I made multiple runs of this first go-round. I added the weights for a total of three times, and each time a deflection was detected. I apologize, but the third run didn't get recorded as it was a spontaneous run during an after show for Veterans Talk Weekly after the stream had went off air. One oddity that was noted during the experimentation was during the introduction of weights. Each time we saw an initial push away by the torsion bar before a pull back towards the larger weights. This could be from air current inside the box caused by the weights coming into place. I honestly don't know. Several people in the chats theorize that it could be a gravitational wave in front of the large weights and the bow shock is pushing the torsion bar away. I wouldn't go that far, but it would be pretty damn cool if that were actually true. But with each introduction of M2, the torsion bar clearly rebounded from the entry point, then continued well past its initial rest. All three runs resulted in a deflection of between 5 and 6 millimeters on the measuring tape. Remember that all these measurements are being measured from the left side of the laser dot. Then, as I removed the weights, we again saw a pullback towards the M2. Followed by an oscillation returning to the approximate point of where it began. One confounding factor was the loss of the top-down camera. This prevented me from getting a solid read on exactly where the Lazy Susan and M2 were once they were introduced. Hopefully that won't be a problem for the next run. And now, for the numbers. Here's some basic information about the experiment. All of the weights were measured 25 times to average out for any inconsistencies within the scale. All other measurements were made at least four times in a row and double verified and we removed the measuring device between measurements to ensure that we were coming from an accurate point. All measurements and weights were within what I would consider an acceptable margin of error. The lead sinker weights, or M1, are 1,303 grams each, 61 millimeters in diameter. But also remember that there is a hole drilled out of the center for the torsion bar to enter into. The torsion bar itself weighed 188.5 grams with no weights attached, and 2,795 grams with the M1 attached. The bar itself was 91.9 centimeters from center of mass M1 to M1. During the trial phase, I determined that the natural oscillation of this torsion bar on the wire was 222 seconds. Regardless of how far the bar swayed, every oscillation averaged out to about 222 seconds. The torsion bar was mounted on a .017 guitar string wire, and it was hung 116 centimeters from the suspension. Adding in two 7 millimeter eye hooks brings the wire's total length to 114.6 centimeters. The large weights, or M2, were 96 millimeters by 73 millimeters, and 8,541 grams and 8,671 grams. When I began measuring M2, I was struck by the great difference between the two, even though I removed the bar handle from the same spot on the interior. Originally, they were 150 grams more apart before I spent two hours with a grinder removing the corners and edges from one in a vain effort to bring them to the exact same weight. In the end, I couldn't do it. I got them as close as I possibly could. The only solid data point I could not obtain was the initial distance between M1 and M2 after introduction. I spent many hours and talked to many people trying to figure out an easy way to measure this. But in the confined space of the box, there isn't an easy way to solve this riddle. I may add a tape measure underneath the bar, but I'm not sure how accurate that'll be. 
I can't add electronic devices because that could cause magnetic interference. As much as I'd like to claim that my spare bedroom is a laboratory environment, it just isn't. All of this along with the fact that M1 appears to initially push away, a measuring device would be very tricky. Now, I am adding another camera close to M1 to get a better visualization of the distance for the next runs. With each series, I'm going to capture video from the laser dot and the new cam so that as the weight sways back and forth, I can freeze frame to obtain the visual distance at the exact point it passes the starting line. With this, I can get a visual representation of the starting points to determine if M2 has gotten closer or farther away in between testings because of the motor steps. And now for the results. Here is where I need help from smarter people than me. I have absolutely no expectation that this experiment will actually be able to identify Big G. But if anyone wants to try, I will gladly share your results in a future video. The goal of all of this is to determine how far M2 deflects M1 from its resting point. The torsion wire is 2.957 meters from the wall at a 90 degree angle. This is side B. The resting point for the torsion bar, according to the laser and the measuring tape, is 0 0.703 meters right of the 90 degree point, side A. Inserting a value of 90 degrees for angle C, we are given that angle A is 13.373 degrees. Now with M2 in place, we obtained a deflection of 6 millimeters. This changes side A to 0.643 meters in length. Running the numbers again, we now have angle A as being 12.268 degrees. And now for a little math that I can actually understand. Our initial angle, 13.373 minus our second angle, 12.268. The introduction of M2 into the sphere of influence of M1 caused a deflection of 1.105 degrees. This isn't much, but it is clearly there. Using these numbers along with the torsion bar length, somebody might actually be able to tell me how far M1 fell towards M2 before the tension on the suspension wire pulled it back. So those are the results. After 20 years of wanting to build my own Cavendish, I've done it and it worked. And I'd like to take a quick moment to accept a little praise from Anthony Riley on the thoroughness of my experiment. I did science. I manipulated an independent variable and showed a cause and effect relationship. I'm sorry, Anthony, what was that again? I did science. I manipulated an independent variable and showed a cause and effect relationship. Just one more time. I did science. I manipulated an independent variable and showed a cause and effect relationship. Thanks, that's what I thought. I couldn't have done it without all the amazing support in the community. Now we need to move into a full, long testing phase to repeat this to see what the results are. And here's the way ahead. In a few days, I'm going to start the experiment back up again, and it will run for an entire month. I will introduce M2 and capture video of all the data streams associated with it. Two days later, I will remove M2 and capture video again and all of the data and movements. I will continue this series of testing for an entire month. And if all goes to plan, I will have about 15 data points to compare. And with that information, we should be able to verify that I'm getting consistent results. And if I'm not, we'll have to figure out why. Following the long run, I'll run several short runs with the 20 pound weights. The goal isn't to get full data on these, it's just to evaluate if the observed effect is actually smaller. Then I'll run it again with a box in place where the weights were to see if it's the motion inside the experiment box that causes that initial deflection. And the final test will be neodymium magnets. If M1 is magnetic, these magnets will clearly show an effect upon them. If all goes well, by the middle of October, I will have full results of all the tests. But I need to hurry because my time in Korea is quickly coming to an end. On the 15th of October, I'm going to be moving up north to Camp Casey to backfill for an empty position. Then come back down here to Daegu on the 9th of November to get ready to go home. But when I get back, I won't have enough time to do any more experimentation. All I'm going to be doing is packing up and getting ready to go on a plane. So sadly, somewhere before the 15th of October, I will be doing a Cavendish teardown live stream. Because by the time I get back on the 9th, everything needs to be ready to ship. That doesn't mean this experiment isn't going to get rebuilt at some date in the future. 
clearly I'm going to want to do this with the family and show my kids how it works, but I can't promise when that's going to happen. So mark your calendar. The Furball Cavendish 1.0 is coming to a close. Take care, stay safe, and I'll see you all again soon.